Hi, everyone. I'm Rosie Ward, and this is Show Up as a Leader. All right, we're going to try something a little different for our summer episodes. Rather than going on a summer vacation like many podcasts do, I decided to do a form of a mini book club. For each episode, I will be sharing some key summary items and my thoughts on a book I'm reading. I'll also provide some suggestions and questions I invite you to consider as you hopefully read the book. Additionally, we are planning for another Ask Me Anything episode at the end of summer, where I take your questions and share my thoughts, and that can be on anything related to these summer book episodes or anything in general. This time, you get to be part of the episode. Simply leave a message with your name and question for me at 877-373-6850, extension 1. And we'll also put this information in the show notes. So I'm super excited to have these summer episodes and this little detour, and let's get started. For today's Summer Book Club episode, I'm taking a look at Adam Grant's latest book, Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. If you're not familiar with Adam, I just love him. He is an organizational psychologist at the Wharton School, where he has been the top-rated professor for seven straight years. His books have sold millions of copies, his TED Talks have been viewed over 25 million times, and his podcast, Work Life with Adam Grant, has topped the charts. His pioneering research has inspired people to rethink fundamental assumptions about motivation, generosity, and creativity. He's also been recognized as one of the world's 10 most influential thinkers and 40s, Fortune's 40 Under 40. He's received the Distinguished Scientific Achievement Awards from the American Psychological Association and the National Science Foundation. I will tell you that I have been a fan of Adam Grant for many years and actually got to meet him briefly a few years ago at a conference. So I was super excited to dig into his latest book. I don't know how else to sum this up except that it will have you rethinking pretty much everything, which I love and appreciate so much. So there is a long book. There's a lot in it. So I'm just going to pull out key things that I think will be valuable for you. If you haven't read it, of course, I encourage you to get it and consider some of these things as you are going through it and what you're rethinking. So Adam starts out by challenging how we think about being mentally fit, right? We think about physical fitness. We think about all different types of fitness. And usually we think that the smarter we are, the more complex the problems we can solve and the faster we can solve them. In other words, we think of intelligence, which is all about our ability to think and learn. However, in a turbulent world, which is certainly what we live in, there's another set of cognitive skills that might matter more, the ability to rethink and relearn. And what Adam says is that one of the things that gets in our way is what some psychologists refer to as cognitive laziness. I will tell you when I first read that, I went, but I, I, I get it. What they say is that we're mental misers, frequently preferring the ease of hanging on to our old views over the difficulty of grappling with new ones. But even more than that, what they say is that questioning ourselves makes the world become even more unpredictable. And it requires us to admit that Facts have changed, that once what was once right may now be wrong, and when we reconsider something we believe deeply, it actually can threaten our very identities, making it feel as if we're losing part of ourselves. Adam writes this, so we favor the comfort of conviction over the discomfort of doubt, and we let our beliefs get brittle long before our bones. We laugh at people who still use Windows 95, yet we still cling to opinions that we formed in 1995. We listen to views that make us feel good instead of ideas that make us think hard. And this is especially true under acute stress where we typically revert to our automatic well-learned responses. 
And as I think about this and I just reflect over, you know, the past 16 plus months with how much our world has changed over the pandemic and how some people definitely went into a rethinking, relearning cycle and some people double down on what was familiar and you start to see polarization and divisiveness and people just wanting to cling to anything that is familiar, which is part of the DNA, but it keeps us incredibly stuck. And one of the things that Adam says is that the reality is that most of us take great pride in our knowledge and expertise and in staying true to our beliefs and opinions. And in a stable world, that might make sense because we actually get rewarded for having conviction in our ideas. The problem is that we've all experienced that we definitely live in a rapidly changing world where we need to spend as much time rethinking as we do thinking. And, you know, I was thinking about this, no pun intended, as I was reflecting on what I wanted to say for this podcast episode, as well as as I was reading the book and just thinking about how many times over the course of my life and career and even this past year that I've had to rethink things. And in the work we do, we talk a lot about paradigms and Paradigms are that lens and that filter that we have on reality that profoundly shapes how we show up. And there are so many paradigms that we need to shift. And paradigms don't change easily because it does bump us up against an identity crisis or it makes us uncomfortable. And one of the examples we use in both of our books actually is telling the story of Galileo and that back in the day, the widely held belief, if you will, or the widely held understanding or paradigm was that the earth was the center of the universe and that everything revolved around the earth. And Galileo wasn't the first person to suggest that wasn't the case, but he was the first person to provide evidence. He invented the telescope, right, to prove it. And what's so interesting is it was so threatening to that widely held belief or paradigm of the time that he was forced to live out his days in house arrest. And there were many people that wouldn't even look through the telescope. It was so threatening. And if I bring that back to modern times, I think about the social justice crisis and the racial reckoning that sparked in 2020 with the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others. And I think about rethinking this whole idea of what are we taught in school and systemic racism and what we know about and what we know to be true and what does it mean to, you know, just not be racist versus being anti-racist. And there's been so much rethinking for me going on about oppression and about privilege and just so many things that I've been grappling with. And it's uncomfortable and, and really trying to sit in that space. And so I just think that there's, such opportunities, while there's also struggles, to come out as better, stronger versions of ourselves when we do open ourselves up to rethinking. And I think that's one of the things I love so much about this work and Adam Grant's work. And even at one point in the book, he talks about that he's rethinking some things he put in one of his previous best-selling book, The Originals, which I also like. And so I just appreciate that he's on his own journey of rethinking. And I know in my career, starting out in worksite wellness, there were times where I was advocating for what I thought were best practices. And he talks about best practices in here about keeping us stuck versus like next practices or emerging practices. And there are things I used to advocate for and sell clients on and speak on that now I'm like, ugh, right? But because I opened myself up to rethinking and shifting and embracing the discomfort of, well, if I don't do this, now what do I do? And so I just, there's such relevance in this. And a lot of the work we do is about busting paradigms. Certainly not easy, but super, super necessary. So the book itself, if you haven't read it yet, is broken down into three parts. The first part of the book is focused on individual rethinking and why we need to and how we can update our own views which is by itself is hugely valuable. If you only read the first part of the book, I highly recommend that section. The second part focuses on interpersonal rethinking and how we can expand our influence and open up other people's minds. So when we think about maximizing our positive impact, that section definitely comes into play. And then the last part focuses on collective rethinking and how we can create communities of lifelong learners. So whether that's in an organization or in your neighborhoods or family or community groups or whatever that might be. 
I also want to say that I really appreciate his evolution from self to others and then going to that greater collective community as that's really how we approach developing individuals and teams in the culture transformation we do we do with companies. It fundamentally has to start with ourselves. It, it cannot start anywhere else. So as we look at the first part of individual rethinking, one of the things that Adam says is that rethinking is both a mindset and a skill set. And one of the things that really struck me is what he refers to as thinking more like a scientist rather than a preacher, prosecutor, or politician. This is what he says, and this so resonated for me. As we think and talk, we often slip into the mindsets of three different professions, preachers, prosecutors, and politicians. In each of these modes, we take on a particular identity and use a distinct set of tools. We go into preacher mode when our sacred beliefs are in jeopardy. We deliver sermons to protect and promote our ideals. We enter prosecutor mode when we recognize flaws in other people's reasoning. We marshal arguments to prove them wrong and win our case. We shift into politician mode when we're seeking to win over an audience. We campaign and lobby for the approval of our constituents. The risk is that we become so wrapped up in preaching that we're right, prosecuting others who are wrong, and pot looking for support that we don't bother to rethink our own views. So I just want to pause there for a second, because as I sat there, I thought, oh, good grief. I don't know about you, but man, I definitely can get into all of those roles. And I love rallying people around new ideas and challenging thinking, but I'm like, oh, I def- I definitely can start to get into preacher mode, right? I definitely it can be easy to get into prosecutor mode where people are still doing things in a stuck way um, and definitely easy to get into politician mode. So I really started to look at and pay attention to when do I go into those modes and what causes me to go into those and how can I recognize when I'm in those? So I would just encourage you to think about that for yourself as well. And so when we recognize that we don't want to be a preacher, prosecutor, or politician, Adam writes that thinking like a scientist involves more than just reacting with an open mind. It means being actively open-minded. This means we must search for reasons why we might be wrong, not for reasons why we might be right. And then we revise our views based on what we learn. The reality is is that scientific thinking actually favors humility over pride, doubt over certainty, and curiosity over closure. And I see such similarities with the work that I do bringing Brene Brown's Dare to Lead work to individuals and teams because curiosity is hugely vulnerable. Curiosity is stepping into the arena. And there's so much judgment and so much righteousness that goes on. And I'm regularly uh, encouraging the people I work with to build the skill to pause And to lean into curiosity and even to say, how might I be wrong about this? And start to question that just because we think it doesn't mean that it's true. And this feeds into another part that really struck me in the book, because one of the things that I've learned in my work with formal people leaders and doing work with physicians and others is there's this sense of, I have to know what I'm doing. I have to assert my expertise and my competence. And that if I admit I don't know something or I show doubt that somehow it's a sign of weakness or people are going to lose faith in me or whatever it is. And so there's a section that Adam talks about of finding our confidence sweet spot. And he says that what we want to attain is confident humility, where we have faith in our capability while appreciating that we may not have the right solution or even be addressing the right problem. That gives us enough doubt to re-examine our old knowledge and enough confidence to pursue new insights. And, And I really like that because what I've learned is that when people are willing to admit they don't know, when they They assert, yeah, I know I have this expertise. I know that I have these capabilities. And I also know that I can only know a sliver of what's going on and I'm open to constant learning. It actually increases our credibility. It increases our trust with with other people. And on the flip side of that, you end up with kind of this overconfidence or what he, you know, looks at arrogance and says that arrogance actually leaves us blind to our weakness, where humility is more of a reflective lens that helps us see clearly. 
And so when you look at confident humility, he says it's a corrective lens that enables us to overcome those weaknesses. And as I said, you know, admitting we're wrong doesn't erode our credibility or competence. It's actually a display of honesty and willing to learn. And it's one of the key trust behaviors in Brene Brown's braving acronym. When we own our mistakes, we take accountability, we acknowledge that we're human, and then we take steps to make things right. I literally was just coaching a physician this morning who was looking at where he messed up and going back and owning it with someone because he didn't handle something well. And the other person was actually surprised he was doing that, yet they had a good laugh about it and appreciated the conversation. And I said, well, people have kind of become resigned that they just accept this behavior. And so by you taking that step to make things right, it's hugely courageous. And it also sets a really important tone just for the workplace culture. Um, And, you know, one of the exercises that I've been doing with individuals and teams for well over 15 years now, I think, involves recognizing when our thinking is on a path that's serving us well or not serving us well. And in our book, Rehumanizing the Workplace, we reference the choice line of being above the line or below the line. And another way that we look at that in the work we do is if we're above the line, we're on a learner path. And if we're below the line, we're on a judger path. And when we're on a judger path, we are very much attached to being right. And so we end up in a very blame focus. So we can blame ourselves like, you know, why did I stay up so late? Why didn't I tell that person what I think? Why did I agree to take on that project? Why did I skip my workout? The list goes on and on. We very much start in this really nasty self-blame process. But we also can do it about others in the world. Why do they do that? Why are they so, so stupid? fill in the blank. And when we stay on that judger path and we don't catch ourselves and we're very much attached to that rightness and blame and focus on all that is wrong, we end up in this like judger pit of doom, if you will. And it's very much unproductive. It's right, wrong, win, lose orientation. And what we don't realize, this is where we can end up going into uh, the prosecutor mode. But what we don't realize is nobody wants to be on the wrong end. Nobody wants to be on the losing end. Our defenses go up. It doesn't open up for collaboration, yet we do it all the time. And so the key is really recognizing when we're there and the signs and signals that we're there, using our body wisdom um, from the last book I talked about, uh, Boundary Boss, and really just the signs that were there and instead pausing and then moving to curiosity by asking questions. I wonder why that person might be reacting that way. I wonder what's going on here. How might I be wrong about this? What is there to learn? What is my part? Um, in, In the Dare to Lead curriculum, we talk about using rumble tools or rumble starters to lean into curiosity. And when we can stay on that learner path, recognizing that there's way more than that's apparent to us and we really practice curiosity, that's what opens us up to a win win. That's where we have thoughtful, intentional, productive solutions. And so if we want to have innovation, if we want to have collaboration, if we want to have productive resolution to conflict, we can't do it when we're in that prosecutor mode. We can't do it when we're on that that judger path. And so this passage in uh, Adam's book really resonated for me as I think about that. He says, neuroscientists find that when our core beliefs are challenged, it can trigger the amygdala, the primitive lizard brain that breezes right past cool rationality and activates a hot fight or flight response. The anger and fear are visceral. It feels as if we've been punched in the mind. The totalitarian ego comes to the rescue with mental armor. We become preachers or prosecutors striving to convert or condemn the unlightened. What's so interesting is the thing is, is that when we're trying to convince other people to change, even with the best of intentions, we can easily slip into the mode of a preacher perched on a pulpit or that prosecutor making a closing argument or that politician giving a stump speech. We are all vulnerable to what he calls the writing reflex or the desire to fix problems and offer answers. I see this day in, day out. I'm guilty of it. I know I can get into a very righteous spot. That's one of the ways I know I'm getting pulled out of my core values and I'm not operating at my best when I'm in this right mode. But how often do we recognize that? How often do you do that? One of the things that I will often ask individuals and groups when we're talking about this rightness conversation or the writing reflex is really this, like notice your attachment 
when it shows up to being right, whatever that might be, rightness to your story, rightness to your beliefs, rightness to your views, rightness to what's happening. And then just ask yourself this, would you rather be right or wildly successful? While most most things in life are not binary, this is, we cannot be judging and we cannot be attached to rightness and be effective at the same time. We cannot be attached to being right and be in meaningful connection with others at the same time. We cannot be attached to being right and actually have success because as we just discussed, when we're in that right, wrong, no one wants to be on the losing end. No one wants to be on the wrong end. Defenses go up. There is no collaboration. There is no effectiveness. Another way you could look at it when you're, especially people who like just really get under your skin is ask yourself this question. Is being right more important than the quality of this relationship? Or is being right more important than the outcome you're trying to achieve? So if you find yourself having that writing reflex take over, try asking yourself one of those questions and see if that allows you to pause and allows you to kind of get off of that righteousness and maybe lean into curiosity a little bit more. And one of the things that can help us let go of this need to be right and be more flexible is making sure that we are grounded in our core values. Uh, There is a great exercise that I think I've talked about before from the Dare to Lead curriculum where you really look at what are your top two core personal values. And then the key is taking them from just words to actually behaviors, operationalizing them. So when you are in alignment with your values, what are the behaviors that show you you're in alignment? And what are the behaviors that tell you you're out of alignment? And then what are the early indicators that tell you you're starting to get pulled out of alignment so you can kind of get yourself back in check? Um, And we can do this on the organizational level too. So many organizations, their values are kind of just BS on a wall, but they haven't actually translated them or operationalized them into clear behaviors that people can use as a filter for how they show up. Um, and, and why this is so important is that if we're asking people to rethink, which is hugely vulnerable, we're asking people to step into the arena, so to speak, and it's uncomfortable. But one of the things is that when we invite people to step into the arena, we're not asking people to go into the arena naked. We always take two things with us. The first we take with us is our values. We ground ourselves in our values. And the second is we replace our armor with grounded confidence, which is really curiosity and leaning in and rumbling with vulnerability. And that allows us to actually practice our values versus profess them. So when I did this exercise, I will tell you that the behaviors became more important than the value word itself. And I've actually changed the value word a couple times, but the behavior didn't. So my two core values are making a difference and grace. The grace one has gone back and forth with courage, but the behaviors are what's important. So when I am in alignment with my value of making a difference, how I know I'm in alignment is I'm focusing on building a nurturing community. I am challenging self-limiting assumptions, both in myself and other people. I am showing up genuine and authentically sharing myself and ideas like these podcast episodes, speaking up even when it's hard. When I'm out of alignment with making a difference, I can definitely have that writing reflex. I push my ideas and get attached to being right. I can stay small and withdraw. I also definitely will overcommit and I can avoid conflict. So those give me my guideposts of how I know am I making a difference in this moment, in this interaction, in this instance. And then with my core value of grace, when I am in alignment, behaviors that support it are I show compassion for myself, which can be (laughs) really hard to do, and others, right? So I let go of that need to be right and show compassion and have that empathy. I'm curious and opening, open to learning, and I express gratitude freely. And when I'm out of alignment with my value of grace, I will make excuses for poor behavior and not address it. I will be really, really hard on myself. I make assumptions, and I get really judgmental and righteous. So that just gives you an example. And so what's great is that I can ground myself in those and go, okay, this is how I want to show up. This is who I want to be. And if I'm going to show up as a daring, courageous leader in these moments, this is what I need to anchor myself with. And 
Adam also talks about values in the spirit of rethinking and talks about the difference between values and beliefs, which I think is a really important distinction. And he says that our values are not our beliefs. They're really guiding principles that show us who we are when we're at our best. They define us and become a filter we use to make hard decisions. So again, if I go back to my values and how I define them of making a difference in grace, like when I'm at my best, I'm showing up in alignment with those two values. And when I have to make hard decisions, I anchor myself and say, okay, what's in alignment with these values? Um, And so when we do the work to identify and then actively ground ourselves in those values, it really does become easier to remain open-minded about what's the best way to live into our values, to advance our values, rather than defining ourselves by our beliefs. And so as Adam starts to transition into the second part of the book on relational rethinking, um, he covers a topic that I see come up over and over over with people on a daily basis, agreeableness. That's where we seek social harmony over cognitive consensus. And that distinction was really, really important for me. I think that I'm better definitely about that uh, than I used to be. But I also see this so much with the work that I do. And I live in Minnesota and there is this saying in Minnesota, they always talk about Minnesota nice. And I will tell you, it drives me up a wall because it's really Minnesota passive aggressiveness. And it's this agreeableness or I'll agree to disagree, but then I'm going to talk about you behind your back. Um, And it just happens all over the place because people just want that social harmony and they're not really understanding the value of what does it take to actually have a helpful distinction between debating and and arguing about task versus relationship. So he talks about this difference between task conflict and relationship conflict. And I've heard it before. I kind of forgot about it. This was really eye-opening for me. And I will tell you in the last week or so, I've brought this forward with a couple of my coaching clients who have this need of people pleasing and have this avoidance of conflict. And they've said this has been super, super helpful for them. So if this is you or you know people like this, Think about the difference between debating on a task and relationship. And what I mean by that is he said that task conflict is like where we are debating about ideas or we're trying to figure out how to approach something or do something. And a lot of what we have day in, day out, particularly in the workplace, really is around task conflict. But what happens is it often spills over into relationship conflict and one of the things he talks about is that if we can frame a dispute as a debate rather than a disagreement, it can signal that we are receptive to considering dissenting opinions and changing our mind, which actually can turn around and motivate the other person to share more information with us. So when you're trying to figure out how to do something or the best way to approach something, rather than taking it as a personal attack on our identity, we're debating and discussing ideas. And we keep it at that idea level or that we all have a shared vision of making this place better or a shared vision of our family being stronger or a shared vision of this relationship improving or whatever it is. And then we, we're really talking about strategies and ideas to make that happen. So one of the things he says that we can start a disagreement around task conflict by just saying, hey, can we debate Can we just debate this? And what that does is it sends a message that you actually want to think like a scientist, not a preacher or a prosecutor. And it encourages the other person to think that way, too. And he tells some really compelling stories about effective negotiators and how they're able to change other people's minds. And I will just tell you, it's pretty fascinating. And I won't give all the details because there's there's a lot there. But in a nutshell, instead of doubling down or I on our ideas and trying to prove our rightness and convince people by making a a good argument. So think about like being a preacher or that politician. What we want to do is establish that we have the right motives and then really acknowledge where we actually agree with our critics and even what we've learned from them. So we start from that place of similarity, of agreement, of alignment. And he talks about viewing an argument as more of a dance rather than a war. And I really like that analogy, right? The dance is kind of a give and take, ebb and flow, where war is it's head to head, battling out, right, win, lose, right, wrong. And we know that doesn't go well. And one of the things that he suggests, which I will say I think takes a lot of self-awareness and a lot of groundedness, which is where our values can be helpful, is that the more anger and hostility the other person might be expressing, the more we want to show curiosity and interest. So 
our tranquility is actually a sign of strength. Our calmness is a sign of strength rather than getting triggered, getting hijacked and kind of taking the bait, so to speak. And if an argument gets really heated, we can always stop and just ask, what evidence would change your mind here? And if someone says, well, nothing, well, then there's really kind of no point in continuing to debate. But if you were to say, well, what evidence would change your mind? And then they have to think about it or they say something else. Well, then you have an opportunity for maybe a different type of, of opening. And there's one story in there that I was just blown away by, especially, again, thinking about the the increased awareness on systemic racial bias and, and systemic racism and really looking at how do we truly have cultures of equity and diversity and belonging. And he tells this amazing story of a man of color named Daryl who actually uses these techniques and the power of conversation of all people to engage with KKK members to open their minds. Think about that a second. Like you have a group of people that is built around this bias and this belief that another group is less than, not worthy, not human, and you're going to actually try to engage and change their mind. But Daryl's done this using these techniques, and he's even convinced several KKK members to leave that organization and those people are now working both independently and with Daryl to advocate for the oppressed and reform the structures that produce the oppression in the first place. And I just think that is so phenomenal. And this is what Adam writes about this. He says, Daryl doesn't do this by preaching or prosecuting. When he begins a dialogue with white supremacists, many are initially surprised by his thoughtfulness as they start to see him as an individual and spend more time with him. They often tap into a common identity around shared interests in topics like music. Over time, he helps them see that they joined these hate groups for reasons that weren't their own. It was a family tradition dating back multiple generations, or someone had told them their jobs were being taken by black men. As they realize how little they truly know about other groups and how shallow stereotypes are, they start to think again. After getting to know Daryl, one imperial wizard didn't stop at leaving the KKK. He shut down the chapter. Years later, he asked Daryl to be his daughter's godfather. Okay, just take that in for a second. I read that and I almost started crying. Like, here is someone who could just easily armor up, shut down, toss, you know, blame and judgment and all these these KKK clan members and whatever. And instead he wanted to lean in and get to know them as a person, but also let them get to know him. Hugely courageous to do that because there's a lot of risks involved on multiple levels and the influence and impact that he is able to have because he's not prosecuting, right? He is not preaching. He's showing up in the arena. He's likely grounding himself in his values, he's being curious, and he's focusing on the relationship and understanding. And I just think if we all did a little bit more of that, I mean, granted, it's hugely complex and there's deep systemic issues, but imagine if each one of us just took some steps to seek out people who were different than us. I don't care if it's about race or religion or gender identity or sexual orientation or whatever, fill in the blank. And we tried to get to know people as human beings and we were curious. Like, I just, I don't know. I just get so emotional and hopeful of what, what could be possible. And it's, it all comes down to some of these fundamental skills and mindsets about rethinking. So with that, another thing that really struck me that I think is useful and we can use right away is when Adam writes about being wary of what he calls binary bias this is our basic human tendency to seek clarity and closure by simplifying something that's on a complex continuum into two categories, right? It's, it's black or it's white, it's male or it's female, it's right or it's left. And how often do you hear people talk about two sides of a coin? What he says, though, is people are more inclined to rethink if we present topics through many lenses of a prism and more on a continuum, what that does is it disrupts what he calls our overconfidence cycles and instead spurs rethinking cycles because it gives us more humility about our knowledge, more doubts about our opinions, and can even make us curious enough to discover information we were lacking. He gives all sorts of 
amazing examples ranging from racism to gun control and many other hot button issues that can be really polarizing and argued from that binary perspective. And we have to resist that urge to oversimplify complex issues. And again, that really resonated for me because we talk about this in the work that we do when it comes to like behavior change and whatnot, how often we try to oversimplify it. And then we end up treating people more like machines or small children or lab rats rather than honoring the messiness and complexity that it is to be a human being trying to go through some sort of change because we're not predictable machines. Um, and then one other thing that really stood out to me is I, I started reflecting on my education and thinking about my son's education when Adam writes about this incredible woman named Erin McCarthy. She is a teacher who teaches social studies in the Milwaukee area, and her mission is to cultivate curiosity about the past while also motivating students to update their knowledge in the present. So not surprising when you read more about her, she was named Wisconsin's Teacher of the Year in 2020. And one of the things she does is purposely give students old history textbooks. We're talking like back from the 1940s, so they can start to see how the stories change over time. And she actually gave students um, an assignment um, as she, and she does this with her eighth graders. She has them go off into self-directed research where they have to inspect, um, investigate, interrogate, and interpret. It's a really an active learning group project. And what they do is they pick a chapter from their textbook. They choose a time period that interests them and a theme in history that they see as underrepresented. And then they actually go off and rewrite it. So one group took on the Civil War, um, someone else um, looked at World War II um, and looked at the uh, infantry regiments of Hispanic soldiers and second generation Japanese soldiers who fought for the U.S. Army. Um, and so it's just really, really incredible work. I mean, I was just thinking about this and, and what she says is, you know, it just, even if you're not a teacher, even if you're not giving people these assignments, what we can learn from what Erin's doing, and I just think it's so awesome that she's teaching her kids these skills at a young age, but that every time we try to help someone think again, we are actually doing a similar type of education. So whether we are doing instruction in a classroom or in a boardroom or in an office or in our, at our kitchen table, there are ways that we can make rethinking central to what and how we teach. And so it's really made me start to think as a parent, how can I foster this in my son, Peyton? How can we do this with our friends? Um, any one of us has the opportunity to serve in that educator role and really help people rethink. Um, and one of the things that Adam talks about as well is where we can do this is think about those moments of life transition. So whether it's your first job or a change in marriage or, um, you know, having a second child or, you know, any of those things. And a lot of times when we're at those transition points in life, we might ask somebody who's been through something similar, like what they went through and what did they learn and what do they experience, right? And that helps us rethink, like, what did, I always like to say, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? And once we're on the other side of whatever that transition is, we can then share that for ourselves and what we've rethought. So I was thinking about, you know, what are some of the things that I wish I knew then that I know now, which, right, that's part of the learning journey. But, you know, there's so many things that have shaped my career of how I thought about human behavior change, how I thought about um, incentives. You know, um, I, I think, you know, the insecurities that we have when we're younger about what do people think about us? Um, you know, does this really matter? Um, you know, does working harder really have people love and care about you more. Um, there, yeah, I just, there's so many things that, you know, if I could write a letter to my younger self, which is an assignment I give some of my coaching clients, but if you wrote a letter to your younger self, like your fourth grade self or your 10th grade self, you know, what are some of the things you would want to tell that version? You know, things that you thought then that now, you know, or you think differently about now. Um, and I just think that can be a really powerful, um, exercise. I'm actually thinking I might do that again. It's, it's, it's a good exercise to do. So as we transition to the third part of the book, um, Adam really reminds us that rethinking is not just an individual skill, it's really a collective capability. And it heavily depends on the culture of an organization. One of the things he says is that rethinking is more likely to happen in a learning culture 
where growth is the core value and rethinking cycles are routine. In learning cultures, the norm is for people to know what they don't know, doubt their existing practices, and stay curious about new routines to try out. Evidence shows that in learning cultures, organizations innovate more and make fewer mistakes. And what we know is that these learning cultures thrive under having psychological safety and accountability. And we talk about create fearless environments as one of our rehumanizing principles. And I think that that psychological safety is so huge that people feel like they can be wrong, mess up, make make mistakes, rethink, ask questions. And if we don't have that fearless environment, it it doesn't go anywhere. And what psychological safety does is it, it also helps us uh, really nudge towards learning and nudge, nudge towards rethinking. And he tells he tells a story um, with examples from the Gates Foundation, and that um, that there is this this uh, person who runs around with a index card and really trying to nudge the culture towards learning. On these three by five note cards in her pocket, she has questions to remind herself to ask about kind of everything, and it's you know what leads you to that assumption, why do you think that's correct, what might happen if it's wrong. And then what are the uncertainties in your analysis? And then I understand the advantages of your recommendation. What are the disadvantages? So in every conversation, when you think about proposing a new idea or proposing a new solution, are we actually having those conversations about how did you arrive at that assumption? What do you think is correct? What what would happen if it's wrong? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? I will tell you, I rarely see those, that level of discussion and inquiry happening and we end up going down a path, spinning our wheels, spending so much time on things that we we don't need to. So again, there is so much great stuff in this book. What I want to wrap it up with is just a, a short blurb that is earlier on in the book, but I just think it sums up why we need to rethink, why you want to get this book, how you want to use it to spark your own thinking about where you have opportunities to apply some of these things. He says, every time we encounter new information, we have a choice. We can attach our opinions to our identities and stand our ground in the stubbornness of preaching and prosecuting, or we can operate more like scientists, defining ourselves as people committed to the pursuit of truth, even if it means proving our own views wrong. So my invitation to you is to think about this, you know, what's an assumption that you've been rethinking lately? Or take an assumption that you just hold and notice that rightness to and start challenging where where could you be wrong about this, right? What if you were wrong about this? Another thing I invite you to think about is, are you most likely to slip into that preacher mode, the prosecutor mode, or that politician mode? And what steps, steps can you take to think more like a scientist, And then when you think about conflict and collaboration and idea generation, how can you foster more task conflict without causing relational conflict? And what do you think would open up for you as a result? Another thing to think about is who is someone in your life that you normally have a hard time hearing, right? You shut down, you have these filters, these views about them. Think about... Daryl, the person who sits down with the KKK members, what would happen if you sat down with that person you have a hard time hearing and just listened and tried to understand their views better? Shameless plug previous episode, I interviewed Wendy Lynch and she talks about amazing tools about listening for what matters. That would be helpful in that conversation for sure. And then lastly, if you were going to write a letter to a younger version of yourself, with lessons learned and key areas to rethink, what would you write? So if you haven't read this book yet, again, I cannot highly recommend it enough. I would love to hear your thoughts to these questions um, as you read it. And I hope that you join me in starting to find opportunities to challenge ourselves and to rethink so that we can all get better and we can come together and maybe be a little less divisive. 
And the next book, if you want to pre-read, that I will be looking into is called Choosing Courage by Jim Dieterich. So we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to Show Up as a Leader. If you haven't yet subscribed, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. I'm Rosie Ward, and you can find me online at drrosieward.com, where you'll be able to sign up for my newsletter, check out the books I'm reading, and hear from the people I'm talking to. You can also get more information on what I'm up to professionally, including my coaching and speaking services. You can also find me on LinkedIn at rward, Facebook and Instagram at Dr. Rosie Ward, or email me at rosie at drrosieward.com. And I just want to remind you to remember that you have the choice every day to show up as a leader. So choose courage over comfort, embrace your humanity, and never, ever dull your sparkle. Take care, everyone.